Thank you very much, uh, Sarondo, and uh, thank you to organizers of the meeting and to uh, be in such a distinguished company. It's, it's great. I'm really happy to be here. Um, you may have seen I sent a paper before. You probably haven't had a chance to look at it, but instead of going through that, I wanted rather to modify a bit what I said in relation to the really interesting things that were said yesterday and try to think a bit more in with you, since I think people who come later in the meeting, we have the advantage that we can do that, react a bit more to, to you. So I would still like to bring my comments or focus them around this idea of duality that is quite strong in the paper that I sent you, the idea that we can't really cope with the problems that we have to cope with today if we just keep a purely individualistic view of, of the human being, that we need to add this other dimension, um, which it's not a new idea. We, we're used to thinking about human beings as being matter and spirit or mind and body or something like this. Whereas in, in this form of thinking, the, the non-material part is the intrinsically relational part. And that's the interesting thing from the point of view of social theories and the social problems we have to deal with. But I don't want to, to, to just read what I said. I like to connect this idea with some of the key problems which you were raising or issues that you were raising yesterday, at least some of them. So the first one I like to look at is the problem of complexity um, and especially measurement. Um, now, Jeffrey just showed us that very nice graph and he talked about the SDG index. So, I mean, we do have some me me methods now of integrating measures, but a lot of what you were saying yesterday, especially Sabina and also some other people was about um, the, you know, the huge number of measures, the dashboards, the complexity, also about the different groups working on measurement and not necessarily coordinated with each other, this kind of issue. So um, I think we can have some help in this if we start using this optic. Um, really my, my talk is about imagination because I think we need to give people new ideas which they can start to work with as much as anything. Um, we talked about coordination gaps, we talked about a need for a new ecology of institutions and that kind of thing, but I think we also need some new ideas that can help us imagine and then start to theorize better. So um, in relation to measurement, I'd like to ask to ask two questions, first of all, to help us deal with this. The first question is, what is measurement for? Now, I think we could give a lot of good answers to that. The one that I would like to focus on, because I think it's especially relevant to what we're doing here, is it, it helps us make progress towards objectives. So measurement isn't about um, absolute measurement. It's about relative um, measurement across time and looking at improvement. Um, and I think we really shouldn't underestimate the importance of this. I mean, I'm, I'm sure many of you here wouldn't, but I'm talk also talking maybe to the people who are more coming out of the church background. Um, I had a friend who was um, running a very interesting institute in the United States, and what they were trying to do was to help uh, businesses, but they also worked with Catholic healthcare. They did a lot of different kinds of institutions, looking at how they institutionalized their ethics. Um, so, you know, all these organizations would have a list of principles which were their ethical principles. So they would take these principles and then create matrices with them where they would um, look at how those principles were applied, say, compared to different stakeholders or to different policies or to different stages in their decision making. They had all different types of versions of it. Well, the thing that, was, that makes me talk about this here is that he told me um, that he was very unsure at the beginning when they started this measurement system about introducing scoring into it, um, any kind of numbers associated with it. But he changed his mind when he saw what effect it had on people in the organization. Uh, when they could see that you know, their application of subsidiarity or whatever the principle was to a particular stakeholder from one year to another, had actually improved or else that they could look at the overall scheme and they could see this place is not so good and that place is not so good. We should concentrate our efforts in these two places. Now, it was enormous. He used the word transformative. It was transformative for them to have that measure. And they were talking about ethics, okay? So um, 
I think we, we, sh we mustn't underestimate the importance of measures. However, as you can imagine, I'm gonna say something else now, just kind of the opposite side of the argument, which uh, the second question would be, is there a, a time when we shouldn't measure? Or, you know, what are the things we might be better not measuring? Or could we push measurement too far? Can we try to overburden it with doing too much that we should try to gain in some other way? And I think that immediately, at least when you, I ask that question, makes me think about motivation crowding theory um, and, and how, you know, if you tell people, look, these are your goals for the next year. Um, and as long as you meet those goals, everything is okay. So they just tick the boxes we get what we call a lot in the business world, the compliance mentality. And, and people's intrinsic motivation is just crowded out by just having to tick the boxes. Um, and, you know, that is a huge loss. You know, these, we know from a lot of social research how important intrinsic motivation is. And a lot of people here have done a lot of work on it. Um, and um, so how can we help people be, um, make progress towards goals without getting that effect. And I think it means we need to add another way of helping people achieve goals, a way which is based on inspiration and on um, great stories and on witness and on testimony, um, and which allows people the freedom to follow these examples or, or, or participate in this story and that kind of thing. And alongside the measures, not, not to get rid of, but as a, a parallel, a, a, contemporary, a contemporaneous way of helping people. Um, you know, if we think about the texts which have really influenced things in the world, like the big religious texts or wisdom texts from philosophy and that, none of them have got performance measures in them, <laughs> but they've had huge impact for good in, in the world. Um, and there's a, a funny little thing I might mention in the Bible, in the book of Kings, when, when King David has a census of the people and the prophet Nathan comes and ticks him off for doing it and says, you know, you shouldn't have done that. And I mean, I haven't read all the biblical scholarship on that, but my, my understanding of it is that it, he's trying to control something which he shouldn't really control. And, and I think there's this sense in which we can try to control things too much. We need to leave some things to be free. We need to see some area of freedom at, at, the, at the level of means of achieving something. You know, We're used to thinking that we should be free in terms of goals, but we need to leave people some freedom in means to achieve things as well. Um, and then the, the last thing I, I mentioned, well, now maybe one other thing is, I think another way of saying it, talking about duality again, is that we kind of have to live in the tension between uh, the two famous phrases, if it isn't counted, it doesn't count. And the other phrase, things that really count can't be counted. You know, they're both right. They, 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 and we have to just live with that. We can't get to a more simple explanation. We need this duality. That's what, that's what I want to say. And then the last thing I say about measurement is the importance of historical trajectory. You know, Joseph yesterday was saying employment is sometimes a very important indicator and in other places not so important. Um, and um, I think that just shows that measurement too is part of a narrative. It's part of a story. It's part of the history of an age. We can't just have the own, you know, absolutely global measures. And I think the SDGs do quite a good job in this, as far as I understand, you can modify the measures depending on your local circumstance. So that seems to me a very good use of measures in that, in that circumstance. So that's my first point about measurement. The second point is about telos, about the goals. You know, we've heard Jeffrey, especially yesterday, but today too, but I thought especially yesterday, very beautifully talking about these world goals that we have. Um, and, and Mariana was talking about the mission-oriented policies. Um, and, and, and uh, Stefan was talking about telos too. You know? And, and um, we are coming out of a period in modernity um, which set a certain philosophical mindset, um, which created extremely powerful means. Uh, as, as, Jeffrey, as Joseph was saying yesterday, when you look at the history of economic wealth creation, it suddenly starts taking off at that time, you know. Uh, so there's something incredibly powerful about this synthesis in the Enlightenment at the level of means. Um, 
but it's also extremely agnostic about ends. And that's also part of its system, you know, because I think we could say there's a few factors that's really influential at that time. One of them is the wars of religion. So they just want to push religion out of the public sphere at that point um, in order to sort of say, look, we don't talk about the final objectives. Am I running out of time? Oh, I thought I thought Stefano held up this piece of paper and I thought that meant I was running five out of time. Five minutes, five oh, minutes. Thank you. Um, uh, also a search for uh, uh, more means, making more means because you had massive po populations with no very little economic um, goods. So there was a huge need for these kinds of things. So it was a very effective synthesis at that time, given the circumstances that were people in. Powerful means agnostic about the ends. Well, now we need to add, it seems to me, not say that that's completely wrong. It's just totally incomplete and insufficient for what we need now. We need to add, and this is where we come back to the duality again, another level to our theory, which is, um, which is free about the means, it's coming back to what I was saying about inspiration and narrative, but quite coordinated about the goals, not just agnostic about goals, but the goals that we can agree on, that we work towards, um, and that we um, accept. And I want to touch on something that Sabina said yesterday, because she said, um, you know, we've got some issues about freedom here. You know, she's talking about behavioral economics and said, you know, if governments start nudging people to do things, what, what does that say about freedom and about, about dissent and all that kind of thing? And, and I think, um, you know, if we just have this one layer of what I would call a sort of one dimensional view, where individual freedom is only about being a, a, a minimum number of rules and I have the maximum choice that I can have, then things like behavioral economics used by governments are problematic, even if they are used for good ends, because we can't understand how people could be really free and participate in shared goals, because we don't have a way of explaining that because we don't see intrinsic re re relationality as part of who we are. And that leads me, leads me to the very last point, if I could just say, what I think the most important point that was said yesterday was, um, Maximo is one, I'm sorry that he's not here, about exacerbating inequalities, that the pandemic is exacerbating inequalities. If we don't deal with this issue, we can deal with all the others, but we will constantly have people falling below. The, the. And I think dealing with inequalities is a classic thing about how we have to be able to see a, a relational side and an individual side. We have to be able to see that we can participate in creating a shared output. You know, businesses and societies societies, they are not just nexuses of contracts. They are shared goods that are created because we share and participate in a good that we all belong to. It's my good as well as everybody else's. It's not just a trade-off between individuals. It's a really shared good that we produce together. And then on the basis of that, we can allocate to us each individually, as happens in businesses and societies, so that we can imagine how bringing together the really poor and the really rich they could imagine that they could produce something much better together, participating together, from which then they can all have a, a benefit. Um, so I think this idea about duality, I really want to push it with you that we need to add this other dimension. This is intrinsically relational dimension, this dimension that's based on inspiration rather than uh, motivation from um, measures, which can deal with goals and human freedom and which I think will help us deal also with the inequality issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sorel. Very nice speech. Very concretely, as a woman, congratulations. Uh, agnostic about ends, that is incredibly, yeah, very nice. 